Anime, like any other medium of story, is bound to have some similar characters across popular series. What works, works, and there's no problem there. But this naturally invokes the tireless pastime of comic book shops everywhere, who would win between these similar characters? Today, as we so often do, we're taking a trip back to the 90s to look at two utter classics, Cowboy Bebop and Trigun. Specifically, a battle between Spike Spiegel and Nicholas D. Wolfwood. I would have done Dash, but, well, if you've seen Trigun, I think you know why I can't. But if you haven't, be warned, there are spoilers for both series ahead. If you haven't seen them, give them a watch, they are well worth your time. But with that out of the way, let's get into things proper here. First up, we have Spike Spiegel, the character who made anime look like more than just a nerd outlet in the late 90s. Born on June 26th in 2044, the man from Mars worked for the Red Dragon Syndicate for an unknown amount of time, although it seems to be he was considered as a possible successor by the organization's head, Mao Yinrai, so we can assume whatever the timing was, he had some considerable impact. There he falls for Julia, a woman seemingly involved with his former equal turned rival Vicious, the man who later takes the Syndicate by force for his own. With the tensions growing between the two potential leaders, Spike fakes his death to leave his old life behind and start a new one with Julia. However, Vicious catches wind of the plan and offers Julia the chance to save herself by killing Spike. She refuses, and he leaves Mars alone, forever stunted. What happens in his life from there is somewhere between a reality and a dream, the past and the future left forever in a pointless limbo. Most of what we see from him is in this range, working as a bounty hunter from 2068 onwards with Jet Black as they slowly gather the rest of their crew, Faye Valentine, Radical Edward, and of course, Ayn. Working in a crime syndicate and later as a bounty hunter, Spike picks up some considerable skills. Foremost is his mastery of seemingly every and all firearms. While he favors his signature sidearm, a Jericho 941R, he's seen using any number of weapons throughout the series, including, but not limited to, other sidearms, shotguns, explosives, a net launcher, a flamethrower, and even support equipment like his night vision glasses and some kind of lifeform sensor. It's safe to say the man is heavily armed, seen best in Ballad of Fallen Angels, where he scrounges up weapons hidden across the bebop to confront Vicious once again and he's no rookie with any of them. From precise shots to well-planted explosives, he makes good use of every weapon he's seen with. Probably the best example of this is being able to disarm opponents with a single shot, seen best in Sympathy for the Devil. This gives him an immediate advantage against any other armed foes and details his deadly precision. Another advantage he has in one-on-one -on -one combat is due to his knowledge of firearms, he's able to count his opponent's shots, letting him know when it's safe to duck out from cover and land a blow or move to a better position. This is an invaluable trait and something not often seen from anime protagonists. But even if Spike doesn't have a gun to hand, he's at no disadvantage. His CQC skills are also unmatched throughout the series. He could fight adeptly and against multiple foes at one time even when hung over. He needs to be injured for Vicious to keep up both times they fight, and he takes out an entire gang with nothing but his fists on Kalisto. He follows Bruce Lee's system of Jeet Kune Do, explaining to Rocco, It's not about strength or power. You gotta be fluid. Huh? You have to be like water. That means relaxing the whole body so it can react instantly without resistance. You know, without thought. It means becoming like clear water. But don't think this only applies to physical attacks. It's also part of his extreme agility. He's able to pickpocket with minimal effort so his target would never know the difference until it's too late. This comes in handy in situations where stealth is key, like the multiple times he's seen tailing a target. And he dodges not just punches and kicks, but also hot lead all the way up to machine gun fire usually for just long enough to get into cover, where he then throws his opponent off with a quick shift of weight, drawing their attention to the wrong spot for just enough time to gain the advantage. Some of these could also be considered part of his instincts. He knows where and when his targets will be hiding, he sniffs out all of Faye's cheats and is able to perform similar things himself, and he's just about unambushable, having an innate feel for tough situations and how to get out of them. He can sneak up on anyone, but the reverse is nearly impossible. 
And finally, we can't forget just how indestructible Spike is. He survives brutal near-death encounters, managing to get back on his feet and fight again every single time. And this includes in the moment where he fights through gunshot wounds and punctures on many occasions. And we're not just talking about a shot in the arm, but even direct hits to his stomach. He has no fear of death, allowing him to utilize this indestructible nature to rush right into terrible situations and come out on top. I think it's also good to put a specific label on how he utilized some of these skills as well. The first major accomplishment we witness is in Episode 5, Ballad of Fallen Angels, where he storms the church Vicious is holding Faye hostage in. He walks into a setup solo and leaves it alive, taking out multiple enemies with bigger guns, better vantage points, and more preparation. They have the drop on him 100%, so even just killing a couple of them would be an accomplishment, let alone all of them save Vicious. This is where we can see him dodge rapid fire weapons, utilize cover to the best of his advantage, and apply some precise and deadly shots. Plus his sleight of hand comes into play as he surprises his rival with a grenade even after being shot and stabbed and thrown out of a window. Mad Pierrot is another one of the toughest situations that he gets out of. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time, the Mad Killer locks onto Spike and forces a confrontation. Not only is the clown armed to the teeth, but he also can't be shot, taking away one of Spike's most utilized skills. And with the ability to hover around freely, it's not like he can just lay a couple punches on his foe either. Spike's up against a man whose entire purpose is to be a brutal killing machine. It's a tough situation, and now Spike gets a heavy assist by luck on this one, given the appearance of a toy cat was what he needed to give him the edge to win, but the accomplishment here is more or less just surviving two encounters with Pero. From being juggled like it's a fighting game to taking the brunt of explosives, this was no walk in the park to come out of alive. And naturally, we have his storming of the Red Dragon Syndicate in the final episode, The Real Folk Blues Part 2. This is like what he managed in episode 5, only turned up to 11. He walks in the front door of a major crime syndicate and kills their boss on the top floor. From setting traps with explosives to precise shots under heavy fire to fighting through an injury, this one has it all. I don't even know what more I could say about it. Spike's skills are very consistent throughout the series, so each encounter builds off the last, giving his abilities a very rounded and true feeling. I feel like the best thing I could say is, do you think you could even do the first 5 seconds of what he did? Because I would have accidentally stepped on the grenade and blown myself up, let alone accurately kicked it into the guards. And then we have Nicholas D. Wolfwood, one half of the ideological battle of Trigun, serving as the realist to Vash's idealism. Not many definitive details are known about his past. We get a few hazy ones near the end of the series, where we see that he was the child of an abusive guardian who he later killed, commenting on how it was easier than he thought. Taken in by Chapel the Evergreen, one of the fearsome gung-ho guns, he's trained to be a contrasting pair of preacher and killer, using these skills to take on jobs as a hired gun to pay for his own orphanage, hoping to stop any other kids from ending up like he did. This path in life, mixed with his tragic past, forms the basis for his realistic ideology. And his work as a hired gun changes his life completely when he's contracted by Knives, Fash's brother, to see that the idealist makes it to their final battle alive. Also, apparently the middle initial of D stands for, once translated, What the hell family do you think you're from? I'm gonna tie you up in a raid mat and dunk ya! That doesn't add anything, I just kind of felt obligated to share it. Now, one look at Wolfwood gives you a good hint as to his equipment. While he's seen using other weapons in the series like the numerous Belief Lightning models or Vash's 45 Long Colt, we only really need to talk about the Cross Punisher, the massive cross he carries around under wraps. A hulking mass of weapon, it stays true to the series' name having three features. A machine gun from the long end, a rocket launcher in the short one, and a cache of sidearms in the cross's horizontal. These are listed as 45 ACPs, made by the in-universe Greater Arms Co. They're also specially designed to be used dual-wield, having a secondary trigger which allows the user to rack the slide with their trigger finger. 
When done with them, rather than reloading, he often simply tosses the empty pistols to the side, pulling out two more from the total of eight. So you don't have to worry about long reload times here. Let's just say he's not afraid of excessive amounts of lead. With all of this to it, the Cross Punisher is quite the heavy armament. While he and Vash tend to wheel it with ease, it seemed taking three men to lift in his first appearance, and even then they struggle to heave it for more than a simple toss. This is where we start to see the first of his skills, an immense amount of strength. Not only does he carry this behemoth, but he swings it around like it's nothing, often using it as a shield for incoming attacks. He also puts this strength to use in hand-to-hand -hand combat, knocking out multiple foes in a row with single blows. But don't think his combat ability comes from strength alone, he's also seen to be quite the agile fellow. Not only is he running to duck behind cover, but sometimes he doesn't even need to. He manages to dodge gunfire and even lasers with seemingly minimal effort. Not to mention he's able to outrun advanced drones and giant sandworms. He's a near-perfect combo of speed and power. Naturally, he'd be fine without either of these though, as he's shown to be quite an adept shot as well. In his and Vash's first meeting, he uses an unfamiliar firearm to take out those same advanced drones from afar with a single bullet each. Then he continues his prowess by showing himself to be on level with Vash in the quick draw contest, where he's able to disarm an opponent and then light his foe's cigar with a bullet, not missing a single beat. And he gets to the final round and survives the huge battle afterwards without landing a single killing blow, meaning he was precise enough to ensure no one died. To add even more to the pile, he also has a seeming sixth sense for combat. This isn't just his avoidance of hot lead or taking down massive forces, but definable and impressive feats. He uses the Cross Punisher to block a sniper shot from Kane the long shot on Dash with lightning speed, and later in the same conflict avoids a planned ambush from Chapel the Evergreen. Safe to say, Wolfwood deserves his consideration to be among the ranks of the fearsome gung-ho guns. Now it's time to get into some specific accomplishments. I think the most obvious one is the Quick Draw contest in episode 10, fittingly titled Quick Draw, for both the actual contest and what ensues afterwards. We already mentioned the skills he presented in it, like disarming foes and dodging the rapid spray of a machine gun, but it's important to note that he doesn't even break a sweat doing any of this, it's just another day for him. Plus afterwards, he and Vash take out an entire town's worth of goons seeking to collect Vash's bounty. By my count, they were outgunned at least 33 to 2, facing not just men right in front of them, but also with vantage points around the town, holding hostages, while those two were left mostly in the open. They managed something similar in episode 18, goodbye for now, but we don't really get to see how it was done, although they do say it was around 200 versus 2. Now we could look at the drone facility as something similar, but I think it's better to devote some time to his interactions with the gung-ho guns. He fights four of them, Leonif the Puppet Master, Grey the Nine Lives, Zazel the Beast, and Chapel the Evergreen. Leonif and Grey were well aboard the remaining siege ship, where he takes down an army of puppets from the former and squares off directly against the hulking beast that is the latter. He's forced to utilize his Cross Punisher to its fullest in defeating the Man with Nine Extra Lives, who he then discovers to be more robot than human, making it quite an impressive feat. And Chapel the Evergreen in episode 23, Paradise, is probably his hardest fought battle. His former mentor was always one step above of him, showing himself to be even more agile and adept. The situation is worsened when we see that Chapel has set a sort of ambush, leading Wolfwood through the streets to put him in quite the disadvantageous position. Despite being seemingly outmatched and outplanned, he still comes out on top in the conflict though, besting his old teacher and shifting his philosophy at the same time. It wasn't just a physical accomplishment, but a mental one as well as he overcomes years of failure, and that quick shift is likely what gave him the edge. Now we don't need to set as many rules as we did with Coco vs Balalaika, but we should establish a baseline for the proposed conflict between Spike and Wolfwood. Obviously, we didn't mention Spike's skill as an ace pilot because Wolfwood doesn't have access to anything similar. So we're considering spaceships to be out of the question for this one, limiting their battle to ground combat only. I think we can allow each side as much of their arsenal as they can carry, given each man just to have multiple weapons on them in their own different ways. 
So Wolford gets the Cross Punisher and Spike as much as he can carry as he does in Ballad and the Real Folk Blues. As for where it would take place, I think Gunsmoke, the world of Trigun, is the most fair option. Spike covers terrain from completely urban areas to wastelands, so it's fair to say they would be on equal footing in the harsh wasteland of Gunsmoke. It gives a bit of open space and a bit of deserted towns for cover, letting them play to whichever suits their strategy. And I think that covers all of our limitations, so let's get on to the meat of things here. So who would win between the two? Well, there are actually quite similar characters in terms of skill. You probably noticed I listed a lot of the same traits between the two. Spike has agility on his side, able to dodge machine gun fire, duck behind cover with speed, and flow like water around his opponents. Wolfwood gets most of the same marks under agility, however he isn't shown nearly as fluid in his combat and also never utilizes cover to the same degree that Spike does. While the former can get behind it, he never throws his opponents off with it like the latter. However, he can apply cover anywhere with his cross punisher, which alleviates that issue just a little bit. But I think Spike gets the edge when it comes to agility and speed. Wolfwood, however, has a physical strength that Spike just doesn't. Sure, the space cowboy could close the distance, but he would also have to watch out for the wide-ranging swing of a massive and heavy cross. Getting in close would be a very all-or-nothing tactic to take. We can consider them both on the same level of marksmanship, however. Each has seen disarming foes with their own firearm, making precise shots to free hostages, and generally just being very accurate. Maybe Spike is somewhat less so, but that comes down to Bebop's more realistic presentation and better animation. And although Wolfwood is good enough to land non-fatal blows, so is Spike, he just chooses not to. So I give them equal footing when it comes to using their weapons. The one advantage Wolfwood does have is no one is shooting that beast out of his hands. And if they do so with one of the pistols, well, he just has more in waiting, so he gets a little bit of advantage there. Now, speaking of weapons, that's where things start to matter a little bit more. Spike has a lot at his disposal, but Wolfwood has not just a machine gun, but eight sidearms and a rocket launcher at his side at all times. That last one may be what really matters, given Spike has explosives, but nothing that quick and deadly. His are limited to grenades and C4, but if he does get the timing and placement right, those could be even more deadly. He'll also likely have to be conservative with ammo. He could carry multiple clips, but Wolfwood has at least 8 plus to hand. And I'd say they each have pretty comparable instincts as well. While it may be slightly different situations, they each manage to read impending danger and avoid it without a scratch. This would save either from an ambush, but would probably wane as their fight progressed given they could keep track of the other's position and timing from there, so I don't think this consideration had much impact given they both have such a skill. But for all those areas they're equal in, I think Spike starts to pull ahead in others. The first thing I noticed between the two is on multiple occasions, Wolfwood fails because he doesn't count his shots. Both in the drone facility in episode 9 and on the siege ship in episode 21, he runs out of ammo and pays the price for it, being saved by Vash once and allowing the plant to be destroyed the second time. Spike, however, keeps track of how much his opponent has fired and uses this to his advantage. In episode 6, he waits for his foe to be reloading to both retrieve his weapon and move to better cover where he has to be followed, allowing him to land a crucial shot. And mentioning that Vash saves Wolfwood is very fitting given that's another difference is Spike does most of these feats alone while Wolfwood is more often than not assisted by Vash the Stampede which does bring his standing down a little bit. Now the Preacher's reload time may be minimal but a pattern would still form to be taken advantage of and that's what Spike just does. Plus he has experience against foes who outgun him. I think having fought Mad Perot is probably the most critical given that man was armed to no end even more so than Wolfwood's Cross Punisher. This takes the edge off of its heavy armaments as Spike is used to going against such things. He may take a few nicks or even direct shots in the process, but the man is nearly indestructible, fighting through wounds at a high level many times. He can play the long game with little detriment, something Wolfwood is never shown to do. And although they're both agile, I think Spike's supreme skill is what seals it. Spike isn't shown to be strong, but he's able to use the strength of others to their detriment. 
If an enemy rushes at him, he simply redirects their own force rather than putting his own into it. In this way, he kind of counters Wolfwood's supreme levels of strength. Plus, he has no fear of taking risky strategies even against the vacuum of space multiple times. He's confident in his ability to rush headfirst into near death and win. He could likely say get in close to Wolfwood, avoid the first swing or block of the cross punisher and leave a little surprise for his foe as he does many times. Whether it's a sneaky grenade or some C4 directly on the massive weapon, I think he could throw the preacher off if not land a killing blow with those deadly items. It would be a hard fought battle, don't get me wrong. Wolfwood's strength, minimal reload and change over time and instant cover counter a lot of Spike's usual points of attack. But that just means he has to play the long game and adapt, which we know he can do. He can rush in head first, but always with a purpose and some kind of fluid plan to deal with what he's facing, normally a changing situation. He'll last and overcome, eventually attacking Wolfwood's faults over time. I hate to keep Trigun as the Luigi of the 90s anime brothers, but Bebop comes out on top again. I think the best detail for me is definitely Wolfwood doesn't count his shots, Spike does. I think that sums things up the best. Anyway, slight small off uh, the cuff rants at the end of videos out of the way. Let's get into the ramble about um, other things like subscribing and such. This is a great transition, I swear. Uh, but consider subscribing for more content like this. Much better, actually, I swear. I'll have links in the pinned comment below. First up, my Twitter if you want to follow me a little bit more directly, see what's going on. Uh, maybe some short videos there. I, I don't know, I'm trying out shorts and different things. We'll see what's going on. Uh, my Discord if you want to reach me directly, chat with other fans. We just had a hangout a couple of nights ago, which was pretty cool. So we have uh, some good stuff going on there. And my Patreon as well if you want to support me directly and help me improve the content and get as much as I can that's quality out for you. And you'll get a name at the end of videos like these people on the screen right now. Hopefully I pointed the right direction. <laughs> anyway, more videos on screen, subscribe thing, and I'll just stop rambling, let you get back on with your day and say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon.